Well, we have a center for nanoscale science and technology, CNFC at Illinois. There also happens to be one at NIST, and its deputy director is uh, Dr. Lloyd Whitman. He received his PhD degree in physics from Cornell. Um, after that, he was a NIST postdoctoral fellow. So he had an early exposure to NIST before he moved on to NRL, where he was head of the super science of uh, surface and nanoscience and sensor technology section, which is a multidisciplinary uh, effort at the confluence of uh, uh, nanoscience, biotechnology, microsystems. Uh, he led a diverse portfolio of research, including semiconductor, organic, and biomolecular nanostructures. Uh, and then while he was at NRL, he also served as the science advisor to the special assistant to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, your chemical and biological defense and chemical demilitarization <laughs> programs. And then uh, we got in this, and there he oversees the operations of the CNSD, uh, working closely with the director, uh, developing the, the center's strategies and, and, and programs. He also serves as the liaison to this overall nanotechnology program. and represents NIST on the National uh, Science and Technology Council, Committee on Nanotechnology, Subcommittee on Nanoscope Science, Engineering and Technology, and he co-chairs the manufacturing, uh, nano manufacturing, industry liaison, and innovation working group. Uh, Lloyd has over 160 publications, uh, multiple patents, uh, there is nanoscience and science of technology, Numerous media citations and awards, including a Navy Meritorious Civilian Service Award. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lloyd Wood. It's a pleasure to be here. When I realized they were going to read the whole thing, I had to take two slides out of my talk. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think the first time I was here was about 15 years ago, actually, when I was at NRL with a group from ONR when Joe had a uh, university research initiative program for a while, and I come out every, got the pleasure to come out every couple of years and be a part of that kind of review team. Um, and you know, I'm always, you know, I, I've been here a number of times since then, I'm always impressed by the sort of both depth and breadth of all the science and, and engineering work that's going on here. It's really a great, a great place. Uh, so yeah, when I, when I sort of did my travel, there was a lot of confusion about why I had to go on a plane to Illinois to talk about the CNST. Uh, you know, and why it was the tenth meeting when we'd only been in existence for five years. Um, you know, but so so I said, no, no, we're you know we're the we're the other CNST. Um, uh, but we do have a we actually use different similar color schemes, but with a, a different logo. Um, so so um, I wasn't around when that name was picked, so I, I can't can't comment on that. Um, so uh, I'm going to give it a, a, an overview today about nano, about the nanotechnology in this. Program. I'm just curious, how many people here have had some kind of interaction with this, a collaboration, or gone to a workshop there? Or so, so few. So I hope to sort of increase that a little bit. Uh, uh, so you know, I'm here both as, as a representative of our Nano Center, also as NIST. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about NIST overall and, and how it works, because um, I think that will be helpful. Uh, talk about the nanotechnology program overall, and then about our Nano Center and some of the both what our mission is and some of the kinds of projects that go on. Uh, in, in our CNST. So, so, um, so I, I love to start, you know, sort of with why this exists, and actually it goes back to, to the very early parts of the country where actually in the Constitution it says Congress has the power to fix the standard of those weights and measures, so the importance of having sort of uniform standards was, was recognized early on uh, in George Washington and his actual State of the Union address in 1790 even, you know, said how important it was. And just to show you that things have not, have, uh, things didn't necessarily move a lot faster in colonial times between sort of the White House and Congress. Uh, it, it took till uh, 111 years till uh, Congress acted uh, on these great recommendations uh, to create the National Bureau of Standards. Um, at that time there were a lot of different things going on in, in, in the sort of the, the the growth of the country. There were eight different sort of authoritarian values of the gallon. Uh, the electrical industry was coming online, and there were, were no real standards for how that was going to work. Uh, there were in, industrial instruments had to be sent over to Europe, usually for calibration. And 
things were you know, very uneven quality, of whatever it is you bought. And there was also even, a, I think one of the big instigators was a big fire in Baltimore where they had problems where every fire department had a different sort of thread on each of their hoses that when they came from, they couldn't actually hook up to the fire hydrant. So this really led to this recognition that we needed some kind of an organization that was going to sort of be the national medical laboratories, which, which what this is. This is. So, um, in, uh, in 1900, then the House Committee on Coinage, Weights, and Measures, I don't think we have one of those anymore, established MBS, uh, right, to, to give aid to manufacturing, commerce, scientific apparatus, the scientific work of the government, schools, colleges, and universities. And pretty much this serves basically that same mission uh, today. Um, in the 1980s, when, in particular, I think the semiconductor industry was going through a lot of turmoil and there was a lot of concern about more applied technologies uh, and, and the US role in promoting those technologies. And this got a, a larger uh, portfolio. In fact, took on some external programs to fund support technology. And then we became the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So our current mission is to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science, standards, and technology in ways that enhance economic security and improve our quality of life. That sounds like a good thing to do. And, and actually, if you think about it, from that nanotechnology, it's very easy to sort of fit into the scheme, right? So the, really, it's very organic to the NIST mission, which is just advanced nanoscale measurement science technology and nanotechnology. So you'll see, as I, as I talk about it, how nano is really kind of sort of threaded throughout NIST. Okay. So just a quick snapshot. Uh, last year, our, our, our uh, budget from Congress was about $750 million. It's one of the uh, smaller agencies. Our in, sort of in-house research that most people think about of NIST is about $500 million. It's a little bit higher. We actually one of the few organizations that got a budget increase this year, even in the current climate. Uh, there's about 5,000 people uh, working at NIST uh, total. About half of those are, are federal employees. Lots of people from all their places. Um, uh, about 400 NIST staff serve on various international and national standards committees. So the sort of big parts of NIST are the laboratory and user facilities, which I'll talk more about, and sort of three outside programs, uh, the Baldridge Performance Excellence Program, which is a, now a public-private uh, program that uh, awards, gives awards out to well-managed organizations. They tend to be in healthcare and education. Um, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which is a federal state program, and each state, some states have more than one program, which basically provides support to small manufacturers. They can actually get a kind of like cost share consulting and help with business and strategic and manufacturing processes. And then the most recent, which actually your, your, um, um, one of your administrators mentioned this morning, the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. And this is really very much a nascent program. But I think there's just a handful of people now in this trying to get this off the ground with some limited funding. Uh, and the goal here is to identify, fund, and promote manufacturing in emerging technology areas, including uh, nanomanufacturing, which is a priority now in this. So uh, just a quick snapshot of sort of the, where the money goes. Again, this was um, it, it, the last full fiscal year last year. Uh, so you'll see we had about $750 million from Congress and then another sort of $160 million from other agencies. So this blue part here is the, basically the core research that's in-house. And, and of that, actually, about 18% uh, is some way nanotechnology related. Okay. So that, that part, uh, if you take it all together, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, when it was begun about a decade ago, defined these program component areas, uh, which we report. And it kind of just shows the distribution of things around these different areas, ranging from you know, big areas being instrumentation, devices and systems, and sort of basic research. OK, so um, uh, I guess a year and a half now, we, we, re, we realign, we call it a reorganization, <laughs> um, to make it a little simpler. Uh, so we have sort of three associate directors, something like deans, um, and, uh, and six organ what we call organizational units now. So we have uh, two metrology laboratories. So there's the material measurement laboratory and the physical measurement laboratory. And the material measurement laboratory basically, well, actually started with the chart with PML. The physical measurement laboratory basically is responsible for the fundamental units, all the SI units and all the measurement infrastructure. They, they keep the time, time.gov, and the, the, the talk that we heard about, uh, actually, the chip scale atomic clock, which is actually a program in PML. Um, 
Uh, and we have the material measurement laboratory, which is responsible for the measurement of materials, the properties of things. Um, that also includes much of the standard reference material development that goes on at NIST and, and standard reference data sets and material sets. Most of the sort of bio-related work is in MML, except for some bio-related imaging is in PML. We have two uh, technology laboratories, um, the uh, information technology laboratory, all the cybersecurity thing, all the NIST encryption standards and things like that. Uh, this is, uh, there's a lot of very high profile work there. Um, and then the engineering laboratory, which is, uh, includes things ranging from, um, well, we have a net zero energy building to things related to earthquakes and fires, very strong program to understand fires. Uh, they're very well known, famous or infamous, depending on who you are, for conducting the, the investigation into the, uh, what led to the collapse of the World Trade Center in 9-11. Uh, so uh, all the way down to things like uh, certify, they, they have a facility that you can come to calibrate a, a photovoltaic cell to get a sort of calibrated efficiency level. And then we have two user facilities. Uh, there's the NIST Center for uh, the NIST Center for Neutron Research, which uh, we actually have a reactor on site. It's one of the premier sources for uh, cold neutrons, for neutron scattering, neutron diffraction, uh, particularly strong in actually soft, soft materials work. Um, that operates very much like a DOE DMI. Basically, they have a, 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 a cooperative agreement with NSF to provide some funding. Most people come to NCNR by writing a proposal for beam time, very much like you would at a video facility. And then you would come to figure beam time on a particular instrument and spend, say, a week. There's actually no charge for that. And then the other user facility is ours, which, I will, which operates completely differently. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. So, so how does sort of nanotechnology fit into this? As I indicated er earlier, it's, it's sort of really organic to, to how things work. Um, you know, so we have our, our laboratory research in-house. Uh, a big part of NIST, you know, so NIST is part, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but NIST is actually you know, part of the Department of Commerce. Okay? So we're really, our, our overall goal is to support industry in, in the United States. So we have a lot of workshops, it's not always industry people, um, but we, we hold a tremendous number of workshops to try to understand what are the needs, you know, what are the problems, especially in measurement as a measurement lab, that need to be solved to help, help uh, manufacturing and other industry in the US. Obviously, as the name and standard, the S and NIST, we do standard setting, both developing physical standards and documentary standards. Uh, uh, and then calibrations are done there. Um, Public-private partnerships, this has been a, a partner in the Nanoelectronics Research Initiative, both private funding and also having people work on that. Uh, and nanomanufacturing, we're in the sort of planning stages of, of trying, looking at doing a public-private partnership in that space as well, our user facilities. Uh, we have a measurement research grants program. It's not large compared to NSF, but we do give out grants uh, at the, each of those organizations. Um, and uh, co you know, co coordinate, collaborate with, with everybody in the data technology space. Um, I mentioned workshops. There's usually two to three a year just related to nano. There's something almost every week on some topic at NIST. Just to show you the breadth they'll range from, we had one on uh, carbon nanomaterials, looking at what the metrology needs were um, uh, uh, about a year ago, to um, uh, an international workshop to understand what are the challenges to using documentary nanotech standards, essentially written standards of definitions and, and, and things, and how to get those. Uh, this has been a big problem internationally. Different parts of the world want to do things differently. So one of the, let's see. So, uh, uh, the good segue to sort of international. Um, you know, it turns out NIST actually has a very strong role internationally, uh, both as part of the Department of Commerce and in, in the sort of standard space, right? So, um, you know, if you, a good example of why this is needed is that we all travel internationally and have to carry a bucket full of electrical adapters, right? So, so there's a lot of interest in not doing that with new technologies. Uh, so, so from a a, a policy standpoint, you really want, the, if, if a US industry has developed a standard, we'd really like that standard to become an, an international standard because that makes it much easier for a US company to sell their things overseas. Actually, one of the tagline of our, our new Secretary of Commerce is build it here and sell it everywhere. So the idea is that we want manufacturing in the US, even if it's a foreign manufacturer manufacturing in the US, and selling worldwide. So this sort of harmonized standards is, is really important. Uh, and in particular, important for nanotechnology, 
for example, there's been a European effort to create label, mandatory labeling for things that, create, uh, that contain nanotechnology. And there's, the US has been pushing back very hard on, on that process because it's not clear what that would mean or what, if somebody would see the label. So again, we exercise this sort of leadership by being, and this is a really, a really interesting area of NIST that I'm still learning about, but there's you know, international standards committees, the ISO and ASTM, and, and there's NIST people who do well, significant portions of their time sort of sitting on these committees and working with these kind of, you know, uh, these sort of documents uh, that, that everyone agrees on, for example, what the definitions will be so that every country will define things, or how you would do a, determine an economic metric. Um, so we have a lot of leadership there. And then down into the US, for example, was mentioned in my bio, I'm, I'm the co-chair of this working group uh, on, uh, that basically within the National Amount of Technology Initiative does outreach to the industry, uh, industry groups. So for example, I'll, I participate a couple of uh, times, uh, well, about once a month at a conference call with the uh, uh, a nanotechnology uh, business commercialization alliance with a bunch of nano companies. <laughs> so, uh, standards. Anyone here ever bought the NIST nanopart gold nanoparticles or anything? Just curious. So, so we develop particles. We have gold nanoparticle reference materials. So you, these come with a spec sheet that tells you their size and how they've been characterized. And you can get them in 30, 10, 30, and 60 nanometers. There's now polystyrene nanoparticles, nanoparticulate titanium dioxide, which are coming out really soon. So these are things that are particularly important for things like environmental health and safety studies so that people are using <laughs> the same kinds of materials. Uh, for, for their studies. There's a, a carbon nanotube reference material. It's referred to as soot you can buy. It tells you the sort of length and size distribution. Um, and they're coming out with length sorted suspensions and something called Bucky paper. Uh, so later this year, there's, there should be silver nanoparticles. And then there's other kinds of uh, reference materials, for example, for calibrating electron microscopes. Things like that. OK. So research. Yeah, as I said, it's really integrated. Just, just actually as in the university environment, you'll find nano in many, many departments. You'll find nano throughout NIST. If you're responsible for the meter, uh, um, you're responsible for the nanometer. So, so uh, you know, if you're measuring the, some particular kind of property, a, a thermal property of the material, you've got to measure that on the nanoscale. So um, of that roughly, you know, $100 million of nano money within the NIST, about two thirds of it is throughout the other parts of the organization. Only about a third of it is in our nano center. In particular, sort of the areas that are growing in particular are EHS work and, and, and nanofabrication and nano manufacturing is, are, are ones that are actually growing quite significantly over the last year and will may again next year as well. Okay, so I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk talking about the NIST Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology. Um, you know, so, so why are there so many nano centers? There's a couple of good reasons. Uh, Bob Slott, our director, when he goes towards this, says there's almost as many nano centers as Starbucks. I'm not quite sure that we're there yet. Um, but that's, there's a couple of reasons. One, as you all know, you only want to bring, it's very multidisciplinary. So you really want to bring people together from all different disciplines. Um, um, and, the, and the other probably big driver is the tools are really expensive. So it's really a place where you want to share resources, especially instruments. So we were, we were established as the Department of Commerce Nano Center specifically to sort of provide measurement and fabrication tools um, to, to advance that technology from discovery to production and to do this by making things accessible and making, uh, to a wide range of people, especially and including industry, which tend not to be the favorite partners at, at university facilities. Okay. So um, we operate the uh, Nanofab, I'll, I'll talk about that. We have a multidisciplinary research program that does sort of the next generation. And then we have an important role serving as sort of a hub to the external community. That's, in fact, why I'm here today, in part, to sort of help, help do outreach. And in fact, there's a, an email, as I said, we have a, a, a nano at NIST.gov, which ultimately comes to me. And one of my jobs is sort of keep track of not just the nanotechnology in our center, but throughout NIST and sort of redirect people. So I'll get people to say, can you help with this? Or is somebody doing that? And I'll, I'll hook them up. So sort of quick overview of organization, right? So our whole mission is all about access. We want to provide access to world-class measurements. And we do that in, in, in two different ways. We have a unique sort of hybrid design. Okay? So we have a nanofab, and we operate this part. It's our commercial state-of-the-art set of tools. That's sort of a line I sometimes draw. 
And, and it operates a lot like the NMIN centers, the NSF supported ones, meaning that it's very easy to get into and you pay a la carte. There's a tool rate, you pay X number of dollars for this tool and X one of dollars. We actually use the Coral system that was uh, developed at Stanford. Um, and and uh, it's really easy to get into and it's a commercial state of the art. Now that's really important um, if, you're, if you're trying to support business. Because if a company's coming in and wants to develop something, they can't really develop it on a 20-year-old tool because then that's going to not be a process that's available if they're going to go to a foundry or set up or, or go to some large wafer scale some, uh, assembly somewhere else. And it can't be some cutting edge thing because they don't, then they can't do that either. So it really needs to kind of be commercial state of the art. And we uh, actually spend a lot of money keeping our nanofab in that state. Then we have a research staff, which is sort of a little bit more like the DOE nano centers. Um, in that you work directly with the people on their instruments, but, uh, but you don't actually sign up for that. That's done very much bottom up. Um, and this is sort of the beyond the state of the art. So these people will go out and look for what the challenges are in that technology, and they're cross-cutting and, and develop uh, new ways to do that. Uh, last year, our budget was at 28 million. It's actually about 30, uh, excuse me, it's actually, I think, turning out to be closer to 30 this year. Um, so we started five years ago uh, with a seed group of about 20 people. It was, it was a whole new organization at NIST, not a reorganization. Um, and uh, I joined four years ago when we were about 50, and now we're over 100. Actually, with our summer s s interns and things, I think we'll, this summer we'll be at about 120, which is every possible place to sit. <laughs> actually, less than that. The surf, surf, the, we have 10 students who are going to timeshare in six carols. Um, um, we also have a cooperative agreement with the University of Maryland Data Center, which is particularly important. It enables us, gives us a lot of staffing flexibility, enables us to bring in postdoc, people on sabbatical, our visiting fellows, very quickly and very easily, and regardless of, of citizenship. So, okay. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the NanoFab because though you guys have a great facility, uh, it might not have, have, have everything you need. And we serve not to compete with other places, but to supplement them and, and, and to provide some other unique aspects of our operation. Um, um, we also have an 8,000 square foot clean room, though that's that 8,000 at class 100. It's actually about 60,000 square feet total of space, uh, including space outside the clean room and a whole corridor of things with FIBs and TEMs, for example. We have about uh, probably about $40 million worth of tools and, and, and probably just the clean room is probably about a $50 million building. So it's something like $100 million of, of government investment. Uh, we have very good uh, lithography tools. We have actually two EV lithography systems, uh, Vistec and Ajol. Uh, we're just about in the middle, of, almost done installing a stepper. We have very strong microscopy and fabrication. So we have um, field mission SEMs. We actually have two Titan TEMs. One I'll mention is going to be becoming an environmental TEM. Uh, we have uh, actually three FIB systems now in Zeiss and two FEI FIB systems. Um, what's really different about the academic facilities is that, and, and the way the DOE runs their, their resources like this, is that we have in the NAF about 15 people, basically all from the semiconductor industry, you know, we did just hire somebody from a Florida data center, um, who basically are 100% customer service. So these are not research teams, they're not researchers or expert users that have to train somebody else. Uh, they, they actually, the tools are all part of the facility that I've had, and this is basically a professional staff who just exists to run and maintain tools, maintain baseline processes, uh, train users, and keep the place running. So it's, it's a, you know, it, you can come in and, and come back, you can come and run a process, come back six months later and be pretty confident you're going to run the same process and get the same result. Uh, we do a lot of connecting people, so, so you can come in and you come in with the net of that. If, there's, you, if we know if somebody else at NIST or another user doing something that can help you, we'll connect people together. Okay. So, so this is sort of how it works. Um, it's, it's based on a cost reimbursement model, very similar to Cornell and Stanford in particular. Like I said, it's modeled sort of off of that. So we have, uh, we've, uh, we've charged actually the operating costs. So we're not putting the cost of the equipment in there. Um, um, it's open to everybody, uh, including industry, government, academia. Everybody actually has to go through the same process, including our own research staff. You submit a, a, a short application, basically, can, do we have the capabilities to do it? Can we do it safely? Does it make sense to do? Is it supporting that technology? Um, 
And that whole process of sort of going, of filling, submitting that and getting, saying yes, you can come, can, is typically running about two weeks. It's very quick. Okay. Um, you can apply for reduced rates. Basically, if the project advances our mission of advancing nanotechnology, then we pay about 40% of the cost out of our congressional budget. And that makes the rates similar to academic rates. So just to give a point of reference, the clean room charge, I think, uh, per hour, which includes a lot of the basic lithography, uh, some, some of the lithography and wet chemistry, I think is $27 an hour. Um, um, we provide training, though we're, there is some cost involved in that. Uh, um, we even have the capability to do remote work subject to the availability of our staff. So you have a really specific thing you want done, say, on our e-beam writer that you don't have the capability to do. You can actually send it to us and pay for our staff, like, staff time to actually run it. Um, what's really different about a lot of the other data centers is we don't claim any IP rights at all. So you would not even govern use rights. So if you come in and you invent something as part of your project or our facility, even in the case where we're paying 40% of the cost, we don't, you have not given up anything. And that's really important to, to, to companies. Um, unless, the only exception to that is if you're working with one of our pro process engineers and it becomes a co-inventor. And then it's just like when you co-invent with somebody with a collaborator, uh, another university people working at. So the starting point for the NanoFab always is to contact Vince. He, um, he comes out of the, he worked at Honeywell, Covig uh, uh, and a bunch of other companies, so he knows a lot about processing and things, conversations start with him. Okay, so we talk about our measurement, uh, measurement research. Uh, so this is the sort of the beyond the state of the art. So we have three sort of areas that we're focusing in, but it's designed to be very flexible. So we, we have a really sort of flat management in our organization. We haven't created sort of, we have very, almost no stove piping with the idea that nanotechnology is very dynamic, it's gonna change, so we don't, we don't wanna get into, well, you're in this group or you're in this department, so we can't do that anymore. Or we have to keep doing this because we created something with this name. So there's three areas, feature electronics, uh, and this uh, includes a lot of uh, graphene, topological insulators, nanophotonics, nanoplasmonics, um, spintronics areas. Uh, nanomanufacturing and, and nanofabrication. So this ranges from top down developing new heating resists and ways to measure, say, acid diffusion and resist, to bottom up doing things like DNA templated self assembly. Uh, and then energy, and, 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 and a lot, as everyone here knows, a lot of the innovations in the energy space include nanostructured materials or interfaces. Now, you know, we don't have an energy, so I, we don't have any battery development program, but we have. Uh, a staff member who's developing really neat ways of measuring transport in the battery, and I, actually I'll show that. So the, our goal is to measure, develop these measurement systems or technologies or instruments that can be applied to key materials and energy and then work with other people on those. Uh, so again, it's a sort of bottom-up through collaboration. Uh, so I'll go through to sort of our project leaders. In this area we have, I, I think, we just had one left, 19 people or 18 people. Um, so I'll kind of go through and just to give you a sense. And you, our, this is it's very easy to find on our website. I also have some brochures, a handful of ones people are interested, especially people looking for postdocs. Um, so Joe Strosha, who's an expert on atomic scale characterization and manipulation, and I'll, I'll show an example. He has the, one of the most, probably the most sophisticated scan probe microscopy system in the world. Um, Alex Little, who has a collaboration with Ben Shapiro at University of Maryland, uh, actually manipulating uh, nanoparticles in three dimensions. Uh, Raina Sharma, who's uh, putting together an environmental, she's an expert on TEM and environmental TEM, and will have a system that can do, uh, I forget the temperature and pressure ranges, but environmental TEM with in, uh, in situ uh, optical spectroscopy. Um, uh, Jada McClellan, who does you know, laser atom manipulation and has some really neat technologies for making um, basically fibs using laser-cooled atoms instead of gallium. Um, uh, Greg Gallatin, who uh, does a lot of simulation and modeling of things like nanolithography. Uh, Alex Little, who's actually our group leader and uh, actually a national leader in nanomanufacturing right now and nanofabrication. Bob McMichael, who does nanomagnetic dynamics, things like uh, uh, domain wall dynamics. Uh, John Angaris, who does imaging, a technique called SEMPA development NIST, which can look at things like the, the uh, domain structure in, in, in the, you know, nano scale uh, magnetic storage. Alec Talon, who's looking at the 
nanomaterials, energy storage and conversion, and I'll, I'll show a little project of his. Kartik Srinivasan, who does nanophotonics and how to measure light in small spaces. I'm going to show an example of that. Henry Lezek, who, in addition to being one of the world's experts on FIB, is also uses FIB to make really novel nanoplasmonic devices. Nikolai Zhaynev does uh, electron and ionic transport in both electronics and photonic, uh, uh, like PV systems. Uh, Rachel Kinnair, who's a uh, nanotrobologist. Uh, Vladimir, who does NEMS and MEMS, and I'll uh, let's see. Uh, Mark Stiles, who is a theorist, uh, mostly DFT kinds of things, and uh, has done a lot of theory in spectronics. Uh, Paul Haney, one of our newer theorists, who's looking at the theory underlying things like thermoelectrics and 3D PV. Uh, Fred, who we stole from GE, who's mostly doing thermoelectrics and some other uh, PV work. Uh, Ron Szilai, uh, um, who's looking at artificial photosynthesis type uh, uh, nanopanelists. And then Andrea Centroni, who's looking at trying to do various kinds of uh, infrared and chemical analysis beyond the diffraction of the IR. So I'm going to give a couple of just quick examples of projects and then show two sort of little sort of longer narratives about how things work, how you come and work with us, and how the, when everything works right, it works. So this is a quick couple of the projects examples. And almost all of these involve multiple project leaders and multiple institutions. Uh, so we have um, Kartik and Vladimir working together. Uh, so a big issue with scan probe uh, that, that um, for example, the tip based nano fabrication people would know about, it has to do with the bandwidth of the probes and how quickly you can move them. Um, so Kartik, who's an expert on, on uh, uh, confining light to small spaces through things like ring, optical ring resonators, and Vladimir, who's a net, NEM guy, came up with this really interesting hybrid approach where this structure here is, is a micro disc, a micro resonant optical disc. And then there's a very thin flexure membrane here that with a gap of about 200 nanometers. And these little posts here are landing pads for a pooled optical waveguide, which is a technique uh, Kartik's developed. So basically what happens is they set up a, a resonant optical field in this structure, and the evanescent field interacts with this cantilever. Now why would you do this? Well, you can make this a very high bandwidth uh, uh, flexure device, and you can measure the optical, uh, the change in this optical resonance with optical techniques at extremely high bandwidth, so you can measure the light. So, so basically what you end up with, if you were to turn it down this, turn it on its side, for example, is a, uh, a, a, a scan probe system that has gigahertz bandwidth. Um, so they've actually demonstrated this at a femtomolar per root hertz. It also turns out that by you changing the laser input, you can actually adjust the cantilever stiffness because of the interaction with this nano NEM structure in the optical field. There's a reference. Um, another example, again, of, of energy. Uh, uh, how do you measure? There's a lot of nanowire battery kind of work going on. Typically, most measurements of those systems are sort of uh, ensemble measurements. So Alex is interested in setting up a system where he actually could look at individual nanowire batteries and to look at scaling limits. And, and so this is a case where he actually, by a combination of uh, Nanofabrication and FID um, created individual uh, lithium ion batteries of about a micron of diameter where the electrolyte layers could go down to below 100 nanometers of thickness. And then actually watch this charge and discharge, set this up on a TEM so where you could watch it charge and discharge in situ in a TEM. Um, um, and for example, what, what came out of this was that he discovered that there seemed to be a limit at about 200 nanometers for the electrolyte and you'd start to get a breakdown. So again, it's a question of what is the scaling limit in a system like that? How do you measure it? These particular devices are things that people were looking about, looking at, for example, for, for powering NEMS and remote sensors and things like this. So now, now understanding the origin of the failure can help you make uh, uh, figure out what, where to go in this kind of a research project. Okay, and th this is an interesting example of you know a, a big company, IBM, actually coming to our nanotap to solve a problem over there. Okay. So. They're actually um, working on next generation supercomputer chips where, and this actually is also a DARPA project, I believe, uh, at least initially, where they're actually directly bonding the CPU to memory chips to get rid of the interconnect. Um, so they actually make a stack of memory chips on the side and then bond them, then they have to align them and bond them with features on the CPU. 
So they worry, the problem is when they put these things together, there's a lot of register, they can't do it in perfect registry. So they have to, have to figure out a way to find what the registry offsets were, where they wanted to connect things up, and then do the patterning in one step so that they could bond them together. We had a tool, actually a direct laser writing system with optical uh, pattern recognition, that they had an idea that might be a solution to this problem. So they came to our facility to kind of figure it out and see if it would work. Um, and you know, kind of worked out how all the details and verified that it would work, and now go back to IBM where they're actually, I believe, putting this in production, where now instead of having to buy a tool, wait eight months for it to be delivered, learn how to use it, then maybe then go buy another customized tool, they cut their development time by maybe a year by coming to our facility and getting access to this. Um, and then now they go right to the, you know, buy a customized tool and set up a group. So, all right. So, I'm going to now finish up with sort of some stories of how this kind of works when people come in. I didn't coordinate this with uh, Piotr. He actually talked about the same group. So actually, uh, right, Ralph on Westletter, who was doing this um, the NMR on a chip, he had a postdoc who wanted to do a front end for that uh, with microfluidics, uh, who had never set through the clean room. And he, he literally came one day with a picture. I think he had actually drawn a perfect periodic array of carbon nanotubes. And he said, I want to build this. So, so, um, so, 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 um, uh, he wanted to sort. So, so, so they got together, they actually got members of the research staff together, and they did a brainstorm and said, well, you know, um, we, now that we understand what we want to do, we, do, we think you should actually do this in silicon with a, a deep edge process. And they actually developed a special uh, edge process, silicon edge process to make really high aspect ratio pillars. And after his, First visit, he left with an array, went out and tested it. I think he actually, his second trip, he came back and made it himself. Okay. Um, he actually demonstrated that with microbeads, and I believe he actually he actually took that project with him. So I don't think uh, the Weisslinger group is do pursuing that direction, but he is now continuing it at uh, at UC Irvine. So, uh, so the other side of this is this metric research story. Um, uh, Joe's program is a really good example of how all this works in terms of our, our, our sort of uh, philosophy and, and how we have the place set up. So, you know, a key measurement need for electronics and nanoelectronics is really high resolution imaging spectroscopy. At the most fundamental level, you really want, for things like graphene or topological insulators, you really want to be able to do not just imaging but spectroscopy, and the higher the energy resolution, the better. Right. Um, now, Joe's an expert. He's been built a series of increasingly sophisticated scan probe systems. Uh, and uh, about two years ago, he finished the latest iteration. This is a, a figure of merit for, for, um, for uh, STM, so uh, an energy resolution. So this is basically for a low contrasting with a magnetic field, so mu v over kt. And so our system is up here. It just shows that you know, the thing. This system actually. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute. It's quite elaborate. In fact, he was asked, invited to write an uh, a, a, a article about it in RSI. That was the feature article. Okay. So basically, in response to this measurement need, he developed this unique ultra-low temperature scanning probe system. Um, it has a base temperature of 10 millikelvin, uh, and he operates right around there, 10, 12, uh, 15 Tesla magnetic field, an ultra-high vacuum, an energy resolution of about 10 microelectron volts, and extensive sample and tip prep here is a kind of cartoon. The whole thing sits in a shielded room, which is about 10 feet in square. It sits on that shielded room, sits in our, uh, one of our buildings, which is 30 feet underground. It sits on a 100 ton concrete block on active vibration systems. That 100 ton block on top of that is a 10 ton granite block on a secondary active vibration system. And then the cryostat, the custom cryostat is suspended in there. It has a huge, essentially, epicenter attached to it with things for uh, MDE, uh, a low temperature, regular dust helium temperature STM, uh, a whole chamber dedicated to tip prep, and actually this is a graphene growth chamber right now. Okay. So that's what it sort of looks like. It's an incredibly impressive facility here. Joe pretending to work on this for the, uh, for the photographer. Uh, <coughs> So, so as I'll show you, almost every aspect of this project was a research project down to the preamplifier that would work at 10 millikelvin down in the, in the STM. Um, 
This is his crop of, car crop of postdocs, and actually you can't even see the whole system. And samples go down. This room is on the other side of this little door, so you can actually transfer things in UHV to the system. There's gate valves. Close off the gate valves. Close the door. Close the whole system up, and he will run uh, with a single sample for four to six weeks, usually at least stay cold. Yeah. So let's sort of have, when this all works together, people come to work with us to make use of this instrument. So Joe has extensive collaborations with Georgia Tech and other members of the NRI, uh, with other parts of NIST. We've had faculty members on sabbatical, uh, postdocs, students participate, collaborations with other people at NIST. Um, about the total graphing effort between the different two SDMs, he has a one that operates at 4K, has but actually the 30th paper was accepted yesterday into, into science. Um, um, he's, had, he's had people from Georgia Tech and now I think Columbia undergrads working with him, including people doing their PhD work, uh, making postdocs. Um, this RSI was actually 33 pages, 130 references. The, mic, the dilution refrigerator, usually dilution fridges are really noisy, so this was actually a custom one built to his specifications that Janus actually sells now. Um, um, the, even the manipulator that goes down to the cryostat, that's Joe's manipulator. Bob McAllister made it, uses it on his trade show exhibit. Uh, we, uh, one of his recent postdocs went off to Intel. Now we're looking at actually using graphene as a resistance standard instead of 3.5 materials. Uh, generated a whole bunch of different nanofab processes to make devices for this program. So it just sort of illustrates the sort of ecosystem that goes into, that, that we build around these measurement programs. So who comes? We, we count something called research participants, um, which isn't just users, but it's everyone who's on the paper or use a cooking analogy. So, you know, if someone comes to us to cook their meal, we don't just count the cook, we count everyone who ate the meal at the dinner party. Um, basically the authors. So last year that was about 1,400 people. Uh, about half from academia, a third from NIST, and the rest from industry and, and other government. In terms of institutions, it's about two people from representing about 280 different institutions and 41 states and the District of Columbia. Um, so I'm going to wrap up by just talking about ways to work with CNST and NIST in, and NIST in general. Um, many, almost everyone at NIST generally has what we call just informal collaborations, which would be comparable to any collaborations you would have. Um, with, with other uh, institutions. Um, that, there's almost zero barrier to doing that at NIST. You can come use our user facility, uh, which is very easy to do. Um, you can be what's called a guest researcher, basically, which means you come and reside on site at NIST, which is also very easy, very easy to do. Um, and within our center, we're always looking, we have, again, uh, of what we call our CNSC visiting fellows, which we typically have three or four of at, at, at a time. People come in on sabbatical or, or other, other things like that. Um, for, for people in your research park, you can come and do CRADAs with us. We have uh, CRADA right now with a division of Lockheed Martin. Uh, we had one recently with FEI. Uh, there's a, a summer undergraduate program, so for your undergraduates interested in coming, uh, this, Hired, I think typically there's simply about 100 people come. The summer program, I want to say about the summer programs is the deadlines are really early, like January. So, so you know, sort of around Thanksgiving, if you have undergraduates who want to come to NIST. And, and it's a, it, this is a little bit unusual. They actually apply, the, the, actually the university would apply on their behalf, and it's done with NSF. It's a little bit complicated. But, but the, basically, NSF will end up giving Illinois the money so that the person stays an Illinois employee, but they come to NIST and it solves the employee problem. So like, I think we have nine in our NASA, and we're going to have nine undergraduates working in, in our program this summer. Uh, and then other agencies, as we know, we work with think places like DARP and other agencies all the time. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. We have time for some questions. Right, so what's the status of this ATP program? So the ATP program ended in about five years ago. Right. Then there was a, I, I got to be careful because they, they were very picky about it. it was, there was a new program called the Technology Innovation Program, TIP, which, uh, was, folk, which was a little bit different and then was zeroed out in last year's budget. <laughs> So there are still awards going on. Uh, the, the problem with it is, especially in the current environment, is it just never kind of got big enough. It, it, so the goal of it was to help industry and, and, and sort of be sort of valley of death kind of funding in selected areas. 
But even the big, you know, in, in FY10, it was something like $40 million. So, you know, if you compare that with even some of the DARPA programs, and you say, what kind of impact is that going to have? Then, but they did, in fact, fund, for example, a bunch of nanotechnology, mostly nanomaterials companies, to try to help them get to commercial, you know, get to manufacturing. Um, but in the, in the budget environment, given the choice between funding the in-house programs and funding that program, Congress zeroed that out last year. So the, the official phrase is, it's in the process of an orderly shutdown. So, so uh, are internationals also invited as researchers to come in? Or? Uh, yeah, so in our case, we have an extremely, I have another slide of you know, extremely international group. Uh, right now we have someone like a, we've had, senior, we have a, let's see, gen, someone, a senior person from Japan right now. We've had people from Korea. Our postdocs are from all over the world. So part, part of this is our relationship with University of Maryland is that because our goal is to hire the best postdocs from around the world, from anywhere, does it regardless of where they're from. So we have postdocs from everywhere. Um, um, so yes. So basically any, the, the limitation is anyone can get on the campus. So right now there's about three country. So right now, the, the only real, well, uh, I think s the biggest problem we have right now is with Iranian citizens, so, which can be a problem because there are many Iranians in the, that even have multiple dual citizenship, but we, we have, Commerce Department security has a thing about Iranians, unfortunately. So how, how much did it cost to build Joe Strozio's mic? <laughs> Uh, if I were to guess, uh, it, you know, it, it's it's not counting labor. It's pro probably about five million dollars. That would be my guess for that range, and uh, probably. But that's you know, it took about. I mean, he he's really a lot of it was done in house in our machine shops. Jo Joe's amazing at designing these things. So that that instrument, the I'm, I'm, I'm done, the first time they turned it on with a sample, it worked. <laughs> So they, they turned it on and about six weeks later started writing a date jump paper. <laughs> so so um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an amazing, amazing instrument. It holds 200 liters of liquid helium in the cryostat. <laughs> Are there other major facilities under construction now or anticipated? Well, we're, we're, we're first about finished building. So we built up from you know, scratch about five years ago. So there's still a couple of like the TE, environmental TM system, which is, is under construction will be a, also, probably almost, not as big a room, but probably similar expense. So that's going to be a, a, an impressive instrument. It's done so that it was actually a, one of the pictures I showed was Renu Sharma sitting in front of this with the covers off. But that's going to be a, a, a really unique. Almost all the systems are pretty unique uh, systems. So. Okay, let's so thank uh, the brochures and newsletters, especially for people who are want, want, a, want a quick way to find, you know, follow up or think about postdocs.